And we are now recording. So uh, welcome again, everybody that's coming in here today. We're going to talk about some upland game hunting tips. Um, with us today is Tell Judkins. He is our upland games biologist for the ODWC. Uh, my name is Kelly Boyer. Um, I am a communications and education specialist for ODWC, and I'll be serving as your host today. Um, just a quick uh, few housekeeping deals. Tell's going to go through a presentation and try to hit some highlights uh, of what's going on with uh, predominantly quail and maybe some other upland stuff. Um, how to get started, some regulations, stuff like that. Uh, if at any time you got any questions, just dump them in the chat. Um, I'll try to address those questions if I can as we go along. I'm definitely not the most experienced upland game hunter uh, out there, so hopefully I'll be learning a little bit as long with you guys. Uh, but just dump your questions into the chat and we can revisit those once he gets through his presentation. Um, and then at the end, we'll have uh, some open mic time for some questions. So if you have any questions, just pop on and uh, we'll try to get them answered as, as well as we can. So uh, at this time, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Tell. Um, I'll mute myself. Tell, you can just go on ahead and teach us all about upland game hunting. Sounds good. I appreciate it, Kelly. And uh, thank you guys for joining in today. Uh, we are so we are recording this. Uh, so even though we're doing it really official for just a few of you guys, uh, we are going to try to get this out on YouTube um, so that more people can be able to tune in that way. Um, doing it over the lunch break, it's kind of tough, but hopefully you guys have a snack and can sit back and enjoy and learn a little bit about quail. Um, so I'm going to start off here, put my slideshow up. See if that's going to go through right. Perfect. So you guys should be seeing that slide now. Um, and so today we're going to talk about the Learn to Hunt. Learn to Hunt is a series that we've been doing to try to uh, uh, help teach about different ways of hunting, different styles of hunting, or, or even different species to hunt. Uh, today we're going to talk about the basics of quail hunting. Um, quail hunting is kind of like um, one of those soapboxy topics. So if you ask 100 people how to quail hunt, you're probably going to get 100 different answers. And that's okay. So Today we're going to talk about just the basics on how to hunt, where to hunt, what the regulations are, um, some tips along the way, and then hopefully be able to answer some of the questions that you guys have towards the end of it. So without further ado, let's get started. First, we're going to talk about what is a quail? You know, where can we find a quail? Um, how many quail are there? Uh, so these are the quails of the United States. There's actually six huntable species throughout the United States and one endangered species. So we have the Montezuma's quail, um, sometimes referred to as Mern's quail, depending on where you're at, the California quail, mountain quail, Gamble's quail, the endangered one in the bottom right, the masked bobwhite, and then the two that are here in Oklahoma, the scaled quail and the northern bobwhite quail. As far as telling the differences apart, um, scaled quail are, are more of a slate gray. They have that scaling across their chest, um, and they also, that scaling has a little bit of a blue tip, so they're sometimes called blue quail. The males uh, and females can be difficult to tell apart. Typically, the females have a little bit more white barring there across their wing, uh, if you can see my mouse. Um, the males for the northern bobwhite quail have this really white face mask and are typically a lot more vibrant in color, uh, whereas the females are more drab, so that they're more camouflaged while they're on a nest. So when we look about uh, quail, we want to talk about our quail populations. And so quail are what we call a cyclical species. Their populations kind of boom and bust from year to year. Um, as we can see going back, looking at the results of our roadside surveys all the way back into the 90s, those numbers kind of go up and down pretty frequently. Uh, ever since about 2006, we've kind of leveled off. We had a really big peak back in 2015. You'll hear a lot of quail hunters talk about that year. It was really good. Um, and then we've kind of tapered back off to where we've been the last few years. Uh, big drivers in this include weather and habitat loss. So those are our statewide numbers. Um, I'll also put up the numbers for Northwest Oklahoma. Northwest is typically kind of thought of as the, the go-to spot for quail hunting. Kind of looks like we may have lost tell here for a second. Uh... Nope, I'm frozen. Okay, you're back. Yeah. All right, I'm back. Um, so 
talking about weather, I apologize. I'm pretty rural, so hopefully the uh, the internet will last out. Um, but when we talk about weather, one of the things that we talk about is droughts impact. So here's a, a few maps of Oklahoma showing how how we were drought wise throughout the year. Uh, these weather conditions can really help to make us aware of problems on the area or help in planning a hunt. Where do we want to go? Um, so you can see in March, about half the state was in some form of drought, but in July in the growing season and the nesting season, majority of the state was clear of drought. As we've pushed forward in time, majority of the state has crept back into drought in some uh, form or, or way, but uh, by having no drought condition during the growing season, whenever all those, those plants, those weeds were producing seeds, um, we should have a pretty decent habitat on the ground where there's habitat available. It's hard to talk about quail hunting without talking about hunter numbers. So ever since 1986, we've seen a decrease in our hunter numbers and with that, a, a decrease in total harvest. Um, that's why things like this can help to try to bring a few more people into the sport and uh, invite a few people to come along. Uh, you'll actually notice last year we had fewer hunters, but an increased harvest. So that's, that's a pretty good thing. So we'll start talking about some of the regulations. And again, like Kelly said, if you've got some questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and we'll get those addressed towards the end of it, uh, end of this video. But this is the, the segment taken directly from our hunting regulations booklet. So we're gonna kind of walk through here and talk about what the individual parts of it mean. First, we'll start talking about license requirements. You're required to have a hunting license here in the state of Oklahoma to hunt quail. Um, residents have to have a hunting license. Non-residents have to have the non-resident hunting annual, uh, non-resident annual hunting license. I'll spit that out right. Um, the five-day license is not uh, acceptable or valid for quail hunting. Um, the dates for quail season this year are November 13th to February 15th. That's typically the second Saturday in November to February 15th statewide. We'll talk about this a little bit more later when we go into public lands. But uh, for now, the statewide, those are the dates. Next, we're gonna talk about uh, daily limits. So the daily limit on quail is 10. And then after two days of limits, you'll have 20 quail in your possession. Technically, until you go and har or, uh, eat some of those quail or give some of those quail away, you can't go harvest anymore. So there's actually a possession limit on how many you can have in a freezer at a given time. The legal means of take, our shotgun, typically that's gonna be your, your number one go-to for uh, harvesting quail is gonna be a shotgun. However, you can also use a longbow and legal raptors. Legal raptors being like falconry birds. And if you'd like to know more on that, the general hunting regulations on page 54 have some, some information on that. And there's also the, uh, there's Facebook groups and all sorts of stuff to talk about falconry here in Oklahoma. The next term on the list is pot shooting. So the picture here is actually a really good example of what we're calling a, a pot. Uh, so that's a, a covey of birds that are all coveyed together and shooting them while they're resting on the ground is actually illegal. Um, it's not sporting and it doesn't really give the birds an ample chance. So we've got to get those birds flushed up before we uh, try to pull a shot off on them. Um, so that term's called pot shooting, and it's while any bird is resting on the ground, it's illegal to, to shoot either an individual or a covey. Next, we're going to go in and look at public lands. So seasons on public lands for, for just about anything in the state can vary depending on your public land. So if you're a public land hunter on our WMAs or on our OLAP, we definitely want to make sure we look and see, are there any special area regulations? So I've got a couple of those here that we'll talk about, and these are just some random examples. So if, say, you were go, going to go to Cimarron Bluff WMA up in northwest Oklahoma, um, as we read through here, we see at the bottom, quail and pheasant are closed during the first nine days of deer gun season. Okay, so we can't go there during the, the first nine days of deer gun but hunting hours are actually closed at noon daily for quail and pheasant. So this would be important to know before we make a trip to Northwest Oklahoma to hunt that we'll only be able to hunt on this wildlife management area until noon. Another example, uh, Lexington WMA in central Oklahoma, while there's not a ton of quail out there, there are a few, um, but this in red here is another example of something to look for on our WMA regulations. So on Lexington, it's actually closed to all activity for controlled hunts. So this is another thing that we want to look for uh, whenever we are planning a trip to one of our WMAs. Uh, and then down at the bottom, you'll see that it also has some, uh, it's closed to all of these types of hunting, including quail, um, 
from opening day of deer archery all the way through the first nine days of deer gun. So it's even got a, a little bit fewer days that you can hunt there. Lastly, uh, or a couple of things left to go over on the regulations is first one is shooting hours. So shooting hours are official sunrise to sunset unless there's other uh, rules at play like on our wildlife management areas. A good way to figure out your shooting hours is one, there's a table typically published in the, the wildlife regulations, the hunting regulations, but you can also use your Go Outdoors Oklahoma app. If you click on the sunrise sunset table there in the bottom left corner, it'll actually pull up a chart that tells you where you're at and what the sunrise and sunset is for your location. You can click on this change location in the top. If say you're gonna be out on a WMA, you can drop a pin right there uh, or select the nearest town. And you can also change the date. So if I wanted to look up what sunrise was for, for Saturday for the quail opener, I can look that up today anywhere in Oklahoma by using our app. The last thing to talk about is in, in the regulations is hunter orange. So hunter orange and quail are a lot different than hunter orange and, and deer hunting. Typically with hunting quail, you wanna be seen. So the more orange you have on, really the better because you're typically out there with several other people. And so you wanna be able to quickly know where everyone else is so that you're able to have a safe and, and happy and, and healthy hunt. Um, the requirement though, by law, is if there's an open gun season, you as a quail hunter have to have either a hat or vest of hunter orange. But here's a picture of me last year on a hunt. Um, I've got on a, a, an orange hoodie, I've got a blaze orange vest, a blaze orange hat, um, a blaze orange dog collar wrapped around me there, and then my dog's even in a, an orange collar and an orange vest. So um, if there's anything you can do while afield to make sure that your hunt is safe, I highly recommend it. And so when we're talking about quail hunting, I highly recommend a lot of blaze orange. Um, the birds aren't all that susceptible to it. They're, you're going to be making a lot of noise walking around and, uh, you know, being them seeing you is not really a, a concern. So that wraps up our regulations uh, talk. And again, if you've got questions on those, feel free to drop them in the chat and we can address them towards the end. Next, I want to shift gears into how to quail hunt. So typically, most people hunt quail and other upland game with a bird dog. It's not required. Uh, in fact, in some properties, in some areas, you can probably just go and, and kick a sand plum bush and, and see some birds shake out of it, or at least you could, you know, several years ago. Uh, but I'm sure there's still some properties out there where you, where you can. Uh, but typically, you're going to be utilizing a bird dog much like you would in retrieving ducks or, or anything like that. And there are several breeds and styles out there. Um, the dog that I've got here is, uh, is what I lovingly call our, our quail technician for the state. Um, he's actually a German short hair pointer. He's a really good dog. Uh, his name's Carson. But uh, you've got the German short hair pointers. You've got uh, European pointers. You've got Vishlas. You've got German wire hair pointers. The list goes on and on and on. And uh, if you ask 100 quail hunters, what the best dog is, you'll get a hundred different answers. Um, so really it comes down to what your style of hunting is and, and with that, what kind of dog is best suitable for you. For me, uh, German short hair pointer does a great job for me. Um, but as you're hunting, the dog's gonna be roaming around in a field. Uh, so this was a picture out on Beaver River WMA uh, a couple years ago. And all of a sudden the dog will go on point. So this is a picture of a point where he's not actually pointing at a bird, but it's a really good example. So if we, if his tail was more straight up and down and almost like shaking like wagging a finger, um, that would tell me he's probably on some birds, but the dog locks up on point. At that point, um, the hunter or the dog handler is able to approach that area and hopefully get a covey rise or flush of birds, which is gonna look something like this. Ah, we'll get into that here in just a little bit on, uh, on Upland Game uh, here in Oklahoma. But we get a covey rise of birds. One of the main things to remember, and anybody that's uh, shot trap or shot clays, um, you have to focus on your target. And so with your target, we need to pick one of these birds out to be able to uh, try and effectively take a shot. I always struggle with trying to watch them all because I want to see where they go. Um, and it usually end up missing, <laughs> uh, as most hunters will probably say. So we really need to focus in on one of those birds to be able to take a shot and harvest a quail. Um, and hopefully you've done that and you end up with a quail in hand. Now, don't be discouraged as someone who's new to quail hunting. This picture of me out on Beaver River a couple of years ago is actually a picture with me and my first quail that I was ever able to harvest. Um, sadly, it wasn't over my dog. I didn't have my dog at the time, um, but I'm still hoping to get my first bird over him this year. 
So don't be discouraged if you're new to the sport. I'm just as new as you are. Um, that kind of wraps up the overall how to hunt quail. The next we're going to say, what do we need to hunt quail? Um, obviously, we need a, a method of take, a hunting license, and the ability to go out and hunt. Um, outside of that, really everything is just kind of an added plus. I highly recommend some sturdy boots. So typically with quail hunting is gonna be a lot of walking. So we're gonna to wanna to make sure that we've got some boots that are gonna be comfortable and support our feet and our ankles through uneven terrain and all that type of stuff. Next, some brush pants or some pants that are gonna be a little resistant to thorns. Typically when we're hunting quail, Quail are a, uh, uh, what's referred to as a shrub obligate species, which we'll get into here in a little bit, but shrubs can be thorny, they can be prickly, they can have green briar in them and all sorts of uh, thorns and pokey things, and, and as well as some of those seeds on the prairies can be kind of pokey. So if we can avoid getting those into our legs, all the better. Uh, so some brush pants definitely go a long way. Um, shotguns that are typically used you see just about every caliber that's out there used on these hunts from 12 gauge to 20 to 16 to 28 and even 410. It really comes down to what you as a hunter feel effective with and are able to uh, safely and effectively harvest some game with. Um, and today it comes down to what shells you might be able to find on the shelf. Um, I typically use a 20 gauge just because it's a little lighter and the shells are pretty easy to find. Um, here I'm using an over under, but you can use a, a semi-automatic or a pump or a side by side or um, just about any kind, uh, any kind of shotgun that's out there. I also recommend a vest or pack. So there's upland vests that you can get, upland packs that you can get. Um, overall, they need to have the capability to hold your shells, some water, your harvest, snacks, first aid kit, you name it, whatever you're going to need on a long hike. I also recommend that you dress in layers. So here in this photo, I'm wearing a hoodie. Um, this morning it wasn't too bad, but about an hour after this picture, I was taking the hoodie off because it was getting pretty warm. Um, in the previous photo, I was wearing a coat with a hoodie under it. So dressing in layers really helps you uh, throughout that day on a hunt to be able to take a layer off so that you can be comfortable throughout the hunt. Lastly, if you are using a dog, if you're the dog handler or, or going with the dog, you need to think about what the dog is going to need for that long hike. Um, my dog always has his collar on that has his, his, his name and my phone number and that type of stuff in case we're separated, but I also always have a leash on me just in case I need to be able to leash my dog and take it somewhere out of an area for safety or, or whatever the reason may be. I try to have a first aid kit to be able to handle any nicks or cuts that he or I may get while we're afield, and then plenty of water. We need to make sure that he's got fresh drinking water the same as I do, um, and then lastly, one of the really cool things that they've come out with in the last well, 10, 20 years and have really improved over those years is a GPS or tracking collar. So you can kind of see this um, black device that's attached to my vest there. That actually tells me where my dog is. It'll give me a direction and how far away he is. And it'll also tell me if he stopped moving, like if he's on point. Uh, and then you'll see the antenna there coming off of his collar that uh, allows those two devices to communicate together. So again, most of that is all things that are more icing on the cake and not needed to hunt, um, but they can definitely make the hunt easier or uh, a better experience. That kind of covers our how to hunt quail. And again, this is a lot of information to try to cram into an, a 45 minute talk or a 30 minute talk. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to throw those in the chat. Um, there was a question just a little bit ago on what upland game is. So for the purpose of this talk, we're mainly going to be looking at quail and pheasant being upland game. Um, some states, it really depends on and, and, and programs on what species are included in that, but typically your non-migratory birds that, were, that live in uplands are typically your upland game group. Um, it seems like most agencies kind of have their own definition of that. Uh, but for the purpose of this talk, quail and pheasant are our primary uh, species that we're talking about. Next, we want to cover where to hunt. We're very fortunate in Oklahoma that we've got about a million acres of public land available to you and me as public, as public hunters. So these are available through two different programs, either our wildlife management areas or our OLAP, our Oklahoma Land Access Program. Um, both of these programs offer ample opportunity throughout the state to be able to get out and enjoy the resources and the outdoors around us. Um, to be able to go to these, you can easily go to our website, which is wildlifedepartment.com. In the drop down menu, click on where to hunt, and then that will bring you to two options that I'm talking about the wildlife management area atlas, 
and the Oklahoma Land Access Program Atlas. Oh, went backwards. Um, so with that, um, these have plenty of opportunities and you can kind of click on either the OLAP program, you could click on these icons and that would tell you what species might be available. You can also click on individual WMAs that would tell you what opportunities are out there. Whenever we go somewhere, we want to look at the habitat and be able to think about what a quail is going to need. Um, for a lot of times, I refer to a quail as a soda can with legs because that's a really good way to envision the size of a quail. Now, there's two photos here on this slide. One, this is a bunch of weeping love grass. Imagine being a soda can with legs and trying to run through this. It's gonna be pretty difficult. So you might not hunt an area that was looking as, as dense as this stand of grass because there's probably not gonna be quail there. And on the opposite end of that spectrum, this is a property that's been overgrazed. So on this property, there's not much cover for that soda can with legs. There's no place for it to run away from a predator, so to speak, or to run away from a hunter for that matter. What we wanna look for is something more like this, where you've got a mix of grasses and shrubs. Just like I said a little bit ago, quail are a shrub obligate species. They have to have those shrubs. So if we're hunting an area that has ample shrubs, ample forbs and ample grasses, then we're looking at an area that most likely has some birds or has had some birds. So this would definitely be a better place to start than the previous two photos. This is a much better spot for our soda can with legs. Another way to look at it is what I call geo scouting or online scouting, using Google Earth to zoom into a specific area and look at what's going on on the landscape. This can be pretty tough if you don't already know the, the habitat or you haven't already seen what it may look like, but this is a photo from one of our WMAs. I won't go into the exact details, but because uh, I don't want everybody to try to hit this one spot on Saturday, but if you were to say park a vehicle right up here, and start walking out to try to find birds, I would probably take a path kind of like this. Um, as we work through this, we're working some draws, we're working some, uh, some terrain, some sand hills, but we're also trying to hit these patches. These patches are all sand plum. Um, sand plum is a great native shrub that provides really good resources for uh, quail and, and pheasant and other upland game and other wildlife species as well. Um, and kind of zigzagging back and forth as we go through here, allows us to work a lot of ground. And if we're using a dog, that dog is gonna be trained to zigzag on top of this line, so to speak, uh, to be able to cover the most ground. Um, and so finding that habitat is the key. Obviously looking in areas where you have the best chance of encountering quail make for the most success. Overall, one of the big things to remember with quail hunting is that upland hunting is a special kind of hunt. It's not necessarily about filling a freezer. Like I said earlier with quail, you can only have 20 in a freezer. So if you only have 20, we're probably not stocking up for Thanksgiving dinner, so to speak, just with quail hunting. It's more about getting a field and enjoying time with your friends and your four-legged companions. I often hear hunters frustrated about not finding more birds, but truly that's part of the challenge. Um, obviously, I would love to find a limit of quail every time I go out, but even though I, I didn't harvest a quail at all last year, I still had an amazing time out with friends and my four-legged companion working some ground, trusting my dog and making a memory. Because here in Oklahoma, the outdoors are always open. One thing that I also wanna say is a good way to get involved with quail hunting if you might not have a dog um, or you know, other, you know, don't have a dog or don't have much experience with quail hunting to begin with, a really good place to start is with Quail Forever. Quail Forever is a non-government organization that's uh, very active here in Oklahoma. Um, I work with them a lot through different projects, um, both through the, the, the landowner assistance side and, and projects like this side, um, where they have opportunities to help get youth outdoors, to help get women outdoors, to help get um, first time hunters in general outdoors so that they have an opportunity to go out and see what it's like. Um, and so I would, if, you, if you've never been on a quail hunt, I would get with them and, and hopefully be able to have a chance to get out there and, and find some quail. Um, Without many questions throughout this, this slideshow went a little bit faster than I had planned. Um, but I do wanna remind you that this blurb here at the bottom is really what it's about. And I know I said part of it earlier, but I'm gonna repeat it. Get out there, enjoy the Oklahoma outdoors, work some ground, trust your dog and make a memory. Because we are truly blessed here in Oklahoma that the outdoors are always open. So with that, I will uh, ask if there are any questions.
Uh, someone in the chat saying there's one above about harvest, but. Uh, gotcha. So DPB is asking, um, you have a question about harvest if hunting hurts the population. So that's a really interesting question, um, DPB. Um, so hunting, it, there's not any data today that says that hunting truly impacts or hurts a population. So if we go back to the principles of hunting in general uh, or harvest in general or life as a wild animal, if you've got a population, some of them are going to die in a given year. Um, same as people. Some people are going to die because of illness. Um, if you're a, a, a wild animal, some, some animals are going to get eaten. Some animals are going to get taken in that way. Um, there's not much data that supports that uh, hunting in general takes away from that. Now, throughout the regulations, we alter the season dates on when animals can be harvested. We set a limit to make sure that not too many are being harvested. Um, so with that, it's, it's trying to think of the best way to say it. There's not enough to say today that the population is being truly impacted just by hunting. The main drivers are going to be your weather and whether or not there's habitat on the ground. Um, now, there are some things that can make habitat or make, make hunting more impactful. So, um, but overall, in general, uh, that's not really the case here in Oklahoma. Joseph has a question about uh, what can a private land person do to help quail flourish? So that's a great question. So we've actually got a, uh, a couple of programs, several programs actually, um, that can help you with that as a private landowner. So I'll first say that Quail Forever has public or has biologists that are able to come out and help with uh, private land programs. Um, our agency has regional private land staff. Our agency also has folks like me that are species specific program biologists. So um, for talking about quail specifically, um, I personally have been on about 35,000 acres this year going and meeting with private landowners to help develop a plan uh, to do just that, to help quail flourish on a property. Uh, where we're at right now, population wise, if you, if you build it, they will come, not to steal the line from Field of Dreams, but um, if you build the habitat and make sure the habitat's there, the quail are able to survive and, and thrive on a given property. Um, obviously, property size can come into uh, play with that. If you know we're trying to do it on five acres in the middle of Oklahoma City, we're probably not going to achieve our goals. But if we've got you know a couple hundred acres here or there, uh, we can definitely make some impacts and, and work towards improving that quail population in that area. One of the biggest things that can be done is prescribed fire getting prescribed fire back on a landscape um, that may have been removed for several decades uh, can really help to open that up so that quail and, and pheasant have ample opportunity to move around, chase down food, and also bring back all of those weeds that uh, have been possibly exterminated from the property or uh, just ha don't have the opportunity to grow because grasses have, have gotten too thick. Um, but for more info on that, our website has, uh, has more information about our quail enhancement program um, through our uh, quail page. So if you go to what to hunt and then click on quail, um, you can find out more information about our quail enhancement program. Uh, another question from DPV. Yeah. What's your so, thoughts on raising and stocking quail to increase numbers? So that's a really good question. Um, Imagine you being dumped in the middle of the desert. Um, if, you're, if you're put out in an area that doesn't already have the resources that are there to support you, you're probably not gonna do very well. Up until about uh, the mid 2000s, we actually had a farm where we raised quail and, and gave them away to folks to be able to do, to do just that. Until we started doing um, some telemetry work with those birds, where we actually found the birds that were released that were pin reared, only survived about three or four weeks. In fact, after three weeks, we had a 90% mortality of those birds that had been released because the, the food resources and the cover resources were simply not there. So the best first step to do is to go through and actually improve the habitat. Um, if we've improved the habitat and it's now pristine, um, we might start trying to look at that, trying to reintroduce some birds or translocate some birds. But generally speaking, pin reared birds don't do well. And that could be for multiple reasons. One, they were raised by the same age class. So all of the, the eggs were hatched and the chicks were all dumped into one container with nothing but chicks. 
we've all read Lord of the Flies. We know kind of how that pans out. You don't really learn all of the skills and tools that you're going to need to survive. Um, you also have a limited amount of predation attempt or predation risk. So when a hawk flies over, they don't necessarily need to freeze in a pin because that hawk can't get to them. Um, so they learn through that process that they don't need to hide from a hawk. And so it makes them a lot more susceptible to predation. Um, then pin reared birds are also more susceptible to disease and things like that. So um, pin reared birds are great if you need to train a dog or if you need to do a, a big hunt that you absolutely have to have some birds for. Um, but outside of that, pin reared birds are typically not the, the best result in going towards trying to improve a quail population on a given area. The toughest thing about quail hunting? Um, that depends. Uh, it depends on where you're at. Um, so here in Oklahoma, we're, we're one of the most diverse states. And so if you hunt in southeastern Oklahoma, for instance, uh, the density of timber down there can make it really tough to quail hunt. Um, you might find quail, but you've only got split seconds to be able to, to bring your firearm up and, and fire and, and try to harvest some of those quail. Um, hunting in central Oklahoma can have some of that same problem and, and finding birds can be a, a difficult problem. Uh, up in Northwest Oklahoma, where, um, you know, a lot of folks tend to go, it, uh, the hardest thing up there is probably walking. Uh, you're dealing with a lot of uneven terrain and, uh, and having plenty of water on board to make sure that you stay hydrated and your dog stays hydrated. Um, and then lastly, probably finding, finding the birds can always be tough. Things like a really dry morning or even a really wet morning uh, can make uh, the dogs finding those birds a really difficult task. All right. Good questions. Thank you for the questions, you guys. Any others? Not really seeing any come through. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, I thank you all for joining, and I certainly thank you, Tell, for all that plethora of knowledge. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Again, if any of you have any more questions or anything, you can always reach out to one of us here at the wildlife department, um, specifically tell this is what he does. Um, but uh, this all, uh, this is some good information. I learned a little bit and uh, I wanna thank you all for joining. Appreciate you guys. And uh, hopefully everybody gets an opportunity to get out there this weekend and, and shoot straight and hopefully find some birds. Yes, sir. Well, thank you again. And uh, we're going to go ahead and stop the recording and good luck out there.